when you're gone. All right. We will call to order the pre-meeting for the West Jordan Planning Commission for December 19th, 2023. Uh, we have Commissioner Thomas online and Commissioner Richardson is excused. Otherwise, we are all here and uh, we will enjoy hopefully a brief break and respite after the last two meetings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just going over. Uh Pre-meeting, so a review of the agenda. Any comments, questions on the minutes, text amendment, message of appreciation? Larry, did you want to talk to us about the text amendment at all? It seemed pretty straightforward. Um, it's straightforward. Corey Frederick will be here. He's the public services director. So it's, it really is um, improving lighting at intersections and crosswalks. And, um I think there has been some accidents in the past and we, they just want to try to prevent that, make it as light as possible. Uh, most of the owner, or I should say the majority of it will be installed by new development, you know, but the city will um, put lights in where they feel is necessary for the safety of their pedestrians and not only pedestrians but at intersections because sometimes they can be rather dark and so that's all i got to say on that so great uh in the case training today all right and i need to be able to turn my powerpoint on i don't know there we go and so the what is on the list um, this month's training is subdivision and improvement guarantees for subdivisions. And, and so if you think about a subdivision ordinance, which the city adopts, it's really, it all begins with the general plan that the planning commission just went through this year and recommending approval by to the city council. But the general plan, as you're aware of, is an advisory document. Okay, this is what the Planning Commission and City Council feels that the city should be, as how it should develop. Um, but it's only advisory. It doesn't have any statutory teeth, or we can't enforce it by requiring people to do anything with the general plan. The way you do that, the general plan is enforced through the zoning ordinance one. We're not talking about the zoning ordinance tonight and the subdivision ordinance or regulation. And so what's the difference between the zoning and subdivision regulations? Well, zoning deals with use, uses, you know, you don't have any uses in the subdivision regulation, but you know, property uses in the M1 zone, the R1 zone, any of the 25 zones West Jordan has, all of the uses are specifically uh, in a zone that uh, it regulates. The lot area, that's in the zone, that's not in the subdivision regulation. Setbacks, you know, how far it is from, how far the building is from property lines. Lot frontage, how wide the lot is, you know, that's not in the subdivision regulations. The height of buildings, landscaping and fencing that's all of all of those things are zoning regulations and as you can see they deal uh, mostly with what happens on the lot okay as it's created to the zoning regulation now some subdiv subdivision regulations are a little bit different um, and they deal with a different part of the implementation of the general plan so it talks about the different types of subdivision and i'll go through all of these um, if you're wondering, plot requirements, ability to service, and I mean service with utilities, lot design, block length, road layout, utilities, and all other design requirements. So where does the city get the authority to regulate land use by subdivision? Well, of course, it's cities are always creature of the state, you know, and so the state has to give uh, the enabling the established enabling legislation, excuse me, to allow uh, cities to create an ordinance. And so, as you can see here, it says the legislative body or the city council may enact ordinance, and that's after a recommendation by the planning commission. Um, so they rec can rec they can adopt subdivision regulation. 
And so what it does is it follows kind of the sequential pro process. You adopt the ordinance with all the, the requirements for the subdivision. That's all adopted. The developer follows that. It's approved by the city according to the ordinance. Then the subdivision plat may be filed with the county recorder. And then lots may be sold. It doesn't work the other way around. You can't sell a lot and then create a plot. It's got to follow that sequentially. And then it says in number two, if you if the city doesn't bother to enact a subdivision ordinance, then they can only follow what's in state law. And there are some towns uh, that have not adopted subdivision regulations, but usually what they do is they follow county regulations at that time. Uh, because there just is not a lot of regulations in state law governing subdivision of property. So West Jordan has adopted a, a subdivision code. They've had one since the city, since the 40s, when the, the city or the town was adopted. Uh, you know, it's gone through a lot of variations. And when I was in City Hall, I had a little tiny book like that. And hopefully it survived the Connex box over there. But it was probably like, eight and a half by five little tiny book about that thick that had all of the subdivision regulations and zoning regulations at that time it was maybe eight pages you know now it's hundreds of pages i don't know if it's hundreds of pages it's a lot of pages okay, let's put it that way and so and so what is the purpose of the subdivision regulation? So as you can see in number one, it's to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the city and future inhabitants. It's to encourage and facilitate orderly growth. You know, and I, I think one of the problems the city ran into a few years ago is all of the development probably ended about where Bangor Highway is. And then all of a sudden they proved this big development way out on the west side and call the leapfrog development. Well, they had to run all kinds of utility lines and, and things like that. And what that has led to is the problem that we found that we now have to upsize all those because we they took their best guess on how the, the west side would develop. So subdivision regulations should encourage orderly growth. Now that's not wholly the responsibility of the subdivision regulation, but, uh, is one of the primary purposes. So provide adequate open space for light and air, prevent overcrowding of land and lessen congestion on the streets. You know, secure economy and municipal expenditures. And so what does that mean? Encourage adequate provisions of, for transportation. So just like I said, if you have a big leapfrog development, that's not very economical because you're running miles and miles of pipe, you know, in farmland. So, you know, you should look at economy and it should provide for water surge, school parks and other facilities and services. All of those things we've come to expect in a modern civilized society, you know, that's what the subdivision ordinance regulates and ensure safety from fire and other dangers. You know, and it's, there's been, you know, one of the case studies and planning school was always the great fire of Chicago and how that happened because everything was built out of very flammable materials but very close together there was no way to control fire and so when mrs o'leary's cow kicked the lantern over it burned down half of the city because there was no way to prevent the fire and it just leapt from building to building and that you know and so that's one of the purposes of a subdivision regulation so what are the sub what type of subdivisions do we have we have a minor and a major and a lot line adjustment. So quickly, a major subdivision in West Jordan City is anything of 10 lots or more that requires a dedication of property uh, or streets or property to the city of West Jordan. That cannot be done by staff. It has to come before this body as a planning commission. Under the law, the planning commissioner, planning commission is who accepts the dedications on behalf of the developer for the city. Now, minor subdivision is less than 10 lots, 10 residential lots, 10 industrial lots, 10 commercial lots, it doesn't matter, but there is no dedication. Now, 
you very occasionally we see some that are ten without dedication. It's not very often, but that's the difference between the two. If you remember, and of course, an allot line adjustment is just moving a lot line uh, on adjoining lots or adjoining subdivision lots uh, to maybe somebody wants to expand their lot bigger. Now you can't make a a, a lot smaller than the zoning allows through so a lot line adjustment, but those are the three types of subdivision we have. So what are the plot requirements of a subdivision? So and that's how the plot is arranged. And all of you have seen plots. Many of you, you're all seasoned planning commissioners. You've seen a lot of plots come before you. Uh, so you have regulations on how the plots are arranged. You know, the name of the subdivision, and that's pretty simple. That's in state law, county requirements. You can't develop a subdivision plan if it doesn't have a name on it because that's how we identify a subdivision is by its name. So the survey requirements, signature blocks, there are numerous people, uh, the, you know, Am and Jay, Trish, Matt, any of you who've been, you know, the person signing for the planning commission, there's probably eight or 10 different people that signed that plot. So it gets looked at by a lot of people before it's done because property rights are uh, very sacred in the United States, but we want to make sure everybody's protected. So lot descriptions, road layouts, dedication I just spoke of, and then of course notes. What are the notes about? The notes might say what this easement's for, if this easement's vacated, what this, if there's a fence here, you know, anything that is on the plot that needs further further description is in part of the notes. So the next thing is the ability to service utilities and all design requirements. And so, you know, our, our subdivision requirements, uh, and this is more in, not in the plot, but in there's always accompanying documents that come with a plot that are called the design documents you know we we have this construction documents we call them for the subdivision because it's enough to hand a plot out for 20 lots but how are you going to construct these roads how are you going to build the water how's it going to be laid out all that stuff can't be contained on just the plot sheet that shows what the lot is how big it is what the frontages are what the lot number is because it would get really really messy so it's on accompanying pages the only thing that's really recorded is like the plot that you see the plot page because that's the legal document but all of these construction documents are in a full force and in fact for that subdivision and so that's water layout sewer layout storm sewer roads other utilities and construction drawings is required in the city of west jordan has many, many pages. And these are just a few examples of uh, the construction details um, that have been adopted by the city. And in, in the last few years, the Planning Commission has uh, recommended approval of all of these to the City Council. You can say on the one side, you have a, that just happens to be a local road uh, detail. They all have to follow that. There's nothing different. They can't design their own road. They have to follow this detail. Uh, you can see the residential sewer installation. They have to follow this detail. Street lighting, which we'll be talking a little bit about tonight, but not really about this, but they have to follow this detail. And then storm sewer. So we have all of these details and standards that the planning committee, that staff has had created and vetted the Planning Commission has recommended approval and they've been approved by the City Council. So they're in full force and effect under the laws of West Jordan and they have to be followed. A developer does not have the opportunity to say, well, I'm going to develop this 15-foot uh, road because I think it works better and we're going to dedicate it to you, West Jordan City. No, if you want to dedicate a road to us, it has to meet this standard, okay, because over the years and time and snow plowing and garbage pickup and maintaining these roads, the, the city has found what works best for the city. You know, and I think, Ammon, you're in the business where you have very standard regulations because your group has found that works best, you know, and, and you're not really too into experimenting at this point. You want what works best.
So lot design is another thing in subdivision regulations. I mean, there's just a couple of things um, about lot. You know, and see, it says lot shall have frontage on a public street. You know, why is that important? Why does the commission think it's important to have a lot on a public street? Is it important? If you go back many years in Vernal, out in Vernal, out in Duchesne County, there was people subdividing lots all the place, out, all the time out there. No access to them. No, they were selling lots. Some guy bought the middle of a lot about a lot in the middle of 1500 acres how does he get there we're well, not crossing my property you're not crossing my property so you see why we put them on public or private streets because you have to guarantee the city quite frankly cannot approve a landlocked piece of property it's a violation of state law <clears throat> so um it has to have access on a public street and lots have frontage on two streets shall be prohibited Unless, and this is kind of the, the problem with suburban development, unless it's on a collector street. You know, there's a lot of two double fronting lots, we call them in West Jordan, they have on a residential street, and then back is a collector street, say 1300 West and Bristol Ridgeway. That, you know, the side lot lines shall be right angles. Because believe it or not, we do have some lot lines in West Jordan that are pie shaped. You know, so the front of the lot's 100 feet, and you get to the very back of the lot, and it's six inches. So you want to try to make them rectangles so the property is usable. And then on the E, it says, all land shall be included in lots. Why is that important? You know, if it's not in a lot, or it's not in an open space, or it's not in an easement. Because you don't want some, well, this is just an awful piece of property. So I'm just going to leave that outside of the subdivision and I'm not going to do anything with it. Well, what's the problem that creates is who's going to maintain that? Who's going to maintain that weed and garbage patch and dumping ground? You know, and then it talks about how lots are um, surveyed. Now, this is kind of a, you know, a, a question and answer I've got here for the Planning Commission. So why is street layout, block length. Why do you think block length? You now, in West Jordan, a block can't be more than uh, a thousand feet. Why is that important? What's wrong with a block? And we all know what a block is. Does it matter? Emergency access. Is Emergency one access is one, you know, connectivity. You know, what if somebody has to walk from school? Well, you have to walk all the way around this block. So, you know, if you make a block, oh, it's okay, okay to make it a mile. Well, this little kid down here is walking a mile where this kid's walking 15 feet, you know. So that's important. Now, multiple access points. Why is that important? You can only have 30 houses on one access point. It all goes back to Paul, who's not here tonight. But... And I think it's a good a good rule it's because it's for fire protection. You know, you have more and, uh, you know, there are still some uh, very, very deep uh, cul-de-sacs in parts of this valley. There, We saw one in a neighboring city that probably two and a half miles long, a cul-de-sac. So the fire truck has to drive all the way back there and out. So and there's probably 45, 50 homes on it. You know, what if that? That this was the big problem with um, Summit Park for a long time. It had one one way in and one way out. What if there's a fire on the way in, you know, a forest fire? How does all those people get out? You know, it's for emergency access. Uh, to minimize cut through traffic in residential areas. You know, traffic calming measures. Planning Commission just approved a subdivision plot a few couple of weeks ago that had traffic calming measures, had the chicanes. We tried speed humps for a while and found that they're problematic. And so now they're trying the chicanes. We're trying to slow people down on these long seven, 800 feet drag strips. You know, they're not drag strips, but that's the reason I've always been a fan of on-street parking is it does slow people down. Safe and convenient access between neighborhoods. You know, in West Jordan, in the older part of the city, a lot of our neighborhoods aren't connected at all. 
you know, some child wants to go to one neighborhood to see their friend. And in reality, their friend's house could be a hundred feet away, but they have to go all the way up to a road and back where it turns out to a mile, you know, and there's no access between neighborhoods. They're cut off. Compliance with the transportation master plan. Why do you think that's important? Mayor, why is it important to comply with a transportation master plan? You just had to deal with this a few weeks ago with some angry people, you know, that didn't want a certain road to connect to U111 that's been on the transportation master plan for decades, you know? So good. That, that's good. So we meeting with the neighbors and they're saying, well, we don't need that those roads. There's not that many in this area. And I said, well, it's not just you. It's everybody else that's going past here. Yeah. And they just couldn't get the scope of it. Finally, I said, you know this bridge that we're putting in over at 8600 South? Yeah, we love that bridge. That's going to help us get over here. I said, the people who live there don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So but it looks like that. But they've been on the mass transportation master plan. And that's the purpose of planning is you look out try to look out in the future is a perfect no, because we don't have a crystal ball. We're speculating on what's going to happen, but they're usually educated guesses. Is that what I like to call them? Um, so we uh, regulate cul-de-sacs, you know, how wide they are. You know, I talked about a very deep cul-de-sac. You can only have a cul-de-sac of 450 feet in West Jordan or it has to have special approval. You don't want a lot of those half streets. And a half street is, is a street that doesn't meet the full requirement of the standard. But in some developments, they build only half of that street. Now that requires special approval by the city council because you want to avoid that as much as possible. Temporary turnaround, street names, street names, are important but it's really a function of salt lake county and why is that important is street naming important because you don't want to the, yeah so you can find your addresses yeah see so well jay's a fireman right there you know it all comes back to safety you know jay what, what happens if you have the same street in Riverton as you do in West Jordan, you know, and you're yeah. responding, it can be a problem. Well, where is this? And so the county regulates that very carefully. And you can't have duplicate streets now. Has it occurred in the past? Yes. But it, it doesn't happen very often anymore. So utilities, both public and private, sidewalks and trails and soils. So all of these regulations create a plat and construction documents that hopefully will result, res, result in a residential, industrial, commercial development. So how do we know that they're going to build all of this? You know, most of them do because it's a very, first of all, it's a very expensive process to undertake. It's tedious, it takes a long time, a lot of engineering, a lot of professional work goes into this. You know, a, even a moderate sized subdivision can you can be an engineering fees hundreds of thousands of dollars of design work because it does take a lot of civil engineering work and legal work but say they get all these approval they record it and there's just one part of it they're not putting in well the city bonds for that and so we either take a cash bond so what will happen is the developer will submit what they're improving then our engineers will go look and assign a value to that you know so much say fifteen thousand dollars worth of improvements or three hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of improvements and so what we will require is a hundred percent of the value of improvements be bonded for and what a bond means is if you put it in you get it back so we don't we don't take the money we just hold it and that's just the city's guarantee that if they don't put it in, we can do pull that bond and do that improvement. Did you want to say something, Duncan? Yep. I could probably chime in there. So um, the different types of bonds that Larry's talking about, one is a cash bond with the city. So if it's 350000 worth of improvements, we literally just hold that cash um, until it's time to give it back after our inspectors have um, 
checked everything out, inspected it, and it's time to give it back. Um, another way to do it is they enter into an agreement with a bank and the, the money is held at the bank until the city releases it. Or there's a letter of credit, which is basically a financial institution recognizing and covering that amount of money, um, but not necessarily that there's actual cash in an account. Those are the three ways we uh, provide for that. Now, there is another option some cities allow for, which is a security bond through an insurance company. We don't currently allow for that. It doesn't really protect the city, kind of works out well for a developer, but not so much for a city. Um, and unlike if it's cash somewhere where we can just prove that uh, in the rare, rare instance where the city needs to take that money, hire a substitute developer to finish the improvements, it's really easy to get that money if we're holding it, especially if the bond agreement says we can, we can take it at some point after we jump through certain hoops. Unlike how easy it is if the cash is with us or with a bank, not so easy when you're making a claim against an insurance company because an insurance company can just deny the claim and then we're then we're out you know either the money or the improvements so um so those are the types of bonds and then and then we have option a and b that larry was talking about option a is the construct first where they put the improvements in first before they record the plat they just have to do a warranty for 10 percent or there's option b where they enter into an improvement assurance agreement where they put up the hundred percent they can record first construct the improvements later so and there is the ability to start with option a and in certain instances they can shift to option b so anyway that's just was chiming in on that additional information and finally, bonds are very, very heavily regulated by the state of Utah. So cities, they adopt their own bonding procedures, but they more or less mirror what's in state law. Um, we used to be able to, now these are all for public improvements, curb gutter, sidewalk, water, sewer, roads. We used to be able to bond for private improvements, swimming pools, trails, fences, landscaping. The only thing that we can bond for is if the developer under a development agreement with private improvements agrees to it, or if it's part of a trio, trail or a regional system, we can bond for that, or it becomes a kind of a pseudo public improvement. So that is all I have. Do you have any questions for me on everything you ever wanted to know about subdivision in this is minutes. very informative and I appreciate it. I do have a question. Uh, in the last couple of meetings, we've heard a lot of public comment about schools. I know that we don't have any, I don't think we have any jurisdiction over that, but but there's got to be some sort of interplay between the city and school district. And can somebody just kind of give us an overview of how that works? Yeah, it's, you're correct under statute. Um, the legislature has made it so that a city cannot deny a development based upon the availability of schools, okay? But what we do is we do have dialogue with the school district about what new developments are coming in and the number of units, where they are. And so it's always on their, their they have their own master plan, school master plan. And so, uh, we meet with them quite often so they know what development is coming into the city. So the, it really is, well, we do have communication with them. So they're very aware of what's happening. What, excuse me, what our growth, uh, where it's going to be, what it is going to be in the future. So they're very aware of what's happening with our land use. And when it comes to actually constructing new schools, there again, we have very little uh, in the way of jurisdiction, for example, our, our, you know, normally the fire marshal will go out and do inspections to make sure fire codes being met. That's all handled by the state fire marshal's office. Um, it, it really, we have just to make sure that basic health, safety and welfare is, 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 is being met. So we will review site plans, but basically just to make sure it meshes with our utility systems and things like things like that. So um, we do have a good working relationship though with this Jordan school district. Uh, and does that also apply for healthcare, health facilities like hospitals? 
So who determines when and where a hospital? Is that just done a private? Private, yeah, it's driven by market studies and, and uh, yeah, but we treat them just like any other commercial enterprise. Just give us a minute before six or is it time? It's exactly six. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. All right, we will call to order the uh, December 19th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting for the city of West Jordan. Uh, Commissioner Thomas is online. Commissioner Richardson is excused. All other commissioners are present. Commissioner Quinney will be rejoining us in just a moment. Um, but we will jump right in. So consent calendar first item on the agenda is to approve minutes from December 5th, 2023. Commissioner Wynn. I move to approve the minutes from our previous meeting, December 5th. Commissioner Shelton. I second the motion. Okay, I've got a motion from Commissioner Wynn, a second by Commissioner Shelton. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. Unanimous, this is a bad night. I can already tell. <laughs> All right. Second item on the agenda is a public hearing with planning commission recommendation and final action by the city council. Text amendment for streetlights amendment amend the 2009 West Jordan City Municipal Code section 862 for streetlight installation required citywide ap applicability city of West Jordan applicant. Corey, if you'd like to come up and present this on behalf of the city. Or feel free to just bump over there next to. <laughs> this is my first time presenting, so I've only been here a couple of months. So if I don't do it correctly, feel free to. Yeah, yeah, throw it at me. So this um, this recommendation, a uh, little background came from Council Chair McConaughey, um, one we fully supported. Um, got a little background in it. There's, as you know, there can be. Uh, lapses in crosswalks and lighting, uh, according to our current standards, we space them where we can, but um, we, we, we're proposing to, to amend the current code as it is to, um, do you need me to read all this? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, so to add a street light onto each section, uh, each side of a crosswalk. Um, it would be for new development only. Um, after that, the lights would be dedicated to the city and our city staff would maintain those lights. Um, but it would be for new development. Developers would be required to put them at all marked crosswalks. Um, but they would also, we, we put code in or wording in here that would allow our current city engineer to also um, make sure that it follows the UDOT standards and guidelines. That's really about it. It's pretty, pretty cut and dry. Any questions on it that I could answer? Sure. Yes. Um... It's not un, not uncommon in the news to hear of uh, citizens uh, complain uh, quite vocally when there's been a, an accident or several accidents in the same spot. Those things often make the news. I assume that this is kind of headed in that direction to prevent yeah, things like yep. that from there, happening. From, from my knowledge, there's been a, a couple of incidences in the past and, and, and um, our streetlight crew for one, you know, we, don't, we, we do all we can to maintain the lights that are out but we're, we're fully supportive of this and recommend it because it is doing s steps to prevent something from happening rather than the reactionary at the time. Are there any, are there any hot spots that you've identified already? Yeah, we have quite a few, our engineering team. Um, I wish I had a visual of it. They, they, uh, with their, I don't know how they do it really with GPS GIS, they were able to create a heat sensitive map showing, um, where all of our streetlights are and the dark spots in the city. And so we're, we're doing what we can as our street lighting crew to, to maintain those. But like I say, as of right now, this would just be for new development only. So we wouldn't go back to those areas. I mean, the goal would be one day to then once development's going to do what we can, but that would be a huge financial cost to go back throughout the city. But yeah. All right. Commissioner Quinney has rejoined us at what, 605. Um, I mean, to make this really, really, uh, it's professional, right? This is this is pizzazz. Um, any other questions for staff? I have one. Go ahead. I was just curious. Uh, do you know uh, if is this is going to increase the number of lights in the city by a certain percentage, or it will increase them? Um, 
I don't know a percentage, but it would increase, I would think, quite a bit. Um, like I said, you think of any marked crosswalk would then have a light on each end of that crosswalk. Mm -hmm. um, we're a little <laughs> tight on staff, but like I say, our, our streetlight crew, this is one we fully support. We're, we're willing to, to do the extra work, if that makes sense. But yeah, it will. I don't have a percentage. Um, like I say, we'll no, know right. as more as the yeah. development, I think, is proposed. It's exciting. Thank you. Commissioner Hutch? So help me understand when you say this is for new development only. Yes. Are you saying if I live on a street that was developed 50 years ago and it has poor lighting, I just need to move? Or, <laughs> I mean, I, if I lived on that street right now, I'd be going, well, wait a second. You identified there's poor lighting, but you're not going to do anything about it. Yep, that's a great question. So on under um, section, I believe it's, I'm looking at my notes here, D. The citizen option to install street lighting says that residents of areas which do not have adequate street lighting systems may install at their expense and dedicate to the city street lighting systems acceptable to Rocky Mountain Power Company. So there is, we do have wording in there where it is. It is possible. That's that. that. That still doesn't help me. If I'm the little lady that's lived there for 75 years, I can't afford to put in a street light yet. I know that their children near me are suffering because of it. I mean, yeah. that just, it just feels inadequate to me. Yeah, I, I could probably chime yeah. in there too, and then maybe somebody else, but there's a, an additional option. Obviously the council can fund, right? But like there's, there's programs right now for sidewalks replacement where they determine which ones are the most need of repair. And they, there's a certain amount of money that the council appropriates each year and the sidewalk crews go and repair as many as they can. And, and I'm sure there's probably something like that that's going to happen for uh, streetlights at crosswalks. This, that wasn't the goal of this text amendment, though. This text amendment was at least for new construction. Here's what we want developers to do. And the commitment the city has with this text amendment is that we'll maintain the ones that the developers put in, right? So if they paint the or put up signs to mark them and they put up the lights at each end, the city is committing to replace the paint, replace the sign, replace the light bulbs, whatever. So it's kind of limited scope of this text amendment, but nothing prohibits the council from appropriating money to, to uh, upgrade what's already there. It's just not within the, the uh, context of this text amendment. Thank you. Thank Chair, you Mayor, Chair Allen, something. if I may, already in place, on your utility bill, you have a, a line item for street lights. Part of that is for putting in lighting in areas that don't have it in existing parts of the city. So we're already doing that. And then when we get complaints about concerns about those, then we go and put them in and we do that as well. So when we have those dark spots that he mentioned, there's a lot of them. They look through theirs and they go through and do that. But when we get complaints because people going through, and there's actually been two crosswalks that we did this, this past this year, this year's not over yet, that we added those lights there from input we got from them. So we do have a budget set aside for that. And this past budget season, we increased that by $1 per resident, which will, is the whole purpose of that is to get the dark areas in the city that got missed. In fact, that's the very next code section. If we had, this is 8-6-2, if we were to show up on the screen, which we don't have ready, but... 8-6-3, that's the fund the mayor was just talking about that it's like a utility fund, like a water or sewer or garbage or any other kind of utility fund, but it's just for these types of things for streetlights. So, yeah, we currently follow UDOT guidelines, national highway guidelines uh, regarding lighting. And those are the, what we maintain. If it's not adequate, we will come in and do that. Crosswalks are what's considered an enhancement. There are certain requirements, and that's what our engineering team works out. So we're just looking to enhance it even even further instead of instead of waiting for something to happen, just add it beforehand. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank we'll you. Play Appreciate back your up time. If there's further you. questions after public hearing, <laughs> which uh, brings us to the next segment. So this is uh, identified as a public hearing. So if you are here to speak and would like to about our street lighting text amendment, uh, or if anyone's online would like to do so, you will have three minutes to make your thoughts known. No takers, huh? All right, fair enough. 
we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and bring this back to the Planning Commission for further discussion or a motion. Commissioner Wynn. Based on the information and findings of the required criteria set forth in this staff report and upon the evidence and explanations received today, I move that the Planning Commission forward a recommendation of approval to the City Council for that, this application, finding that an affirmative determination has been made for the criteria found in 13-7D-6B1-4. through four. All right. Commissioner Quinney? Second. Um, <laughs> motion for Commissioner Wynn, a second from Commissioner Quinney. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries unanimously. I'm going to get this word at some point. I know. So amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agenda item number three. We are here to turn some time over to the mayor who has now disappeared. So I will entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I move to adjourn. <laughs> You already embarrassed me once today. We don't need to do this again. I was in a Thank you, Mayor. I should have handed this to you. You need to talk? Oh, there we go. That was the final agenda item. I'll turn the time over to Commissioner Quinney. I move to adjourn. We are adjourned. No, I think I grandstanded. <laughs>